Welcome to Dar Headlines. I'm Wendy Chen. Thank you for joining us. Coming up in the show today, Tsuji volunteers in China are carrying out home visits to help needy students with tuition fees. We go to Miyagi Prefecture in Japan to see how the love and support of Tsuji is helping the 311 quake victims return to normalcy. And in Taiwan, with dengue fever cases on the rise each year, we meet a group of inspection staff who are working hard to fight the mosquito disease. We kick off today's show in China after receiving news of some 300 underprivileged students in need of tuition support. Xiamen City volunteers are carrying out home visitations in hopes of providing scholarship funds to help these children continue with their studies. Chen Rongpei's father shouldered all the responsibilities of a mother when raising him. He has not reached his 50s, yet the wrinkles on his face add more years to his real age. Chen Rongpei's father holds high hopes for his son, hoping that he will have a bright future ahead of him. <laughs> City volunteers from Xiamen walk from rural farms to small villages, visiting the families of these underprivileged students. We want her to be more educated so she does not have to work so hard like us. Our work is very exhausting. Although every household has their hardship, they all have a goal which keeps them going, no matter how difficult things may get. I want him to have a bright future, to become a talent for the good of our country and the people, so this is necessary. Our mother has worked very hard for all these years. She has raised three children by herself. Although we are much older now, we still make her worry sometimes. I wish our mother good health. Because of their hardship, each family has forged stronger bonds. They also encourage their children to set their goals for the future from a young age. I have received a lot of support from the community in the past, and I'm very thankful. When I grow up, I will most certainly do the same to help others in need. As city volunteers walk into each household, they let the families know that hard work and efforts are being recognized. City volunteers are willing to be there for them, making the dreams of these families and students come true. Staying in China in traditional Chinese culture, children are often too shy to show their love to parents. To encourage residents to express their gratitude towards parents, city volunteers visited two companies in Dongguan of Guangdong province to share their personal experiences. <laughs> City volunteers ask employees to hold hands in hopes of bringing a feeling of home and hearth to this company. Inevitably, as a result of Chinese culture, very few people will show affection towards their parents. One volunteer, Wang Ziya, shares her regret that she did not fulfill her filial duty to her father. When my father was sent to the hospital, I was kept out of the emergency room, and I could only watch him receive treatment from the window, and then he was gone. Wang Ziya's story also inspired employees in another company. Many of them start to reflect to see if they have fulfilled their filial duty. You have to show love to your parents promptly, or you may wake up at midnight with regret. How long has it been since you called home and talked to your parents? Honestly, I'm going to call my parents right away. <laughs> The experiences shared by Tsuji volunteers help the employees learn of the importance of cherishing their loved ones in time.
In the aftermath of Japan's 311 disasters, Tsuji distributed consolation cash to disaster victims in the worst hit areas. Since then, Tsuji volunteers have been receiving thank you letters and postcards from quake survivors. Recently, the volunteers once again visited the Shiogama city in Miyagi prefecture to see how their old friends are doing. He says the migratory birds came back and it's winter right now. He also says thank you for the consolation money. The table is full of postcards and letters written by the disaster victims of the 311th earthquake in Japan. The quake survivors continue to write to the city volunteers about their lives. He will write to us and tell us his living conditions right now. He will even tell us how he conducts his daily life, such as when he's on the tram, he will look at the ocean. Following city volunteers to the city of Shiogama in Miyagi Prefecture, we arrived at the home of 72-year-old Miss Suzuki, who lives with her granddaughter. The senior says she has been living in the prefabricated house throughout the winter. She also says that during the winter, she needed to use a heater and had to put cardboards on windows, or else the wind would get into the house. When winter comes, it is really cold inside the house. We need to wear down coats and cotton-made clothes or else we won't be able to handle the cold. What they needed the most is someone that they can talk to, someone that listens to them. You can donate money after eating this and the money can help those in need. Tsuji Fu Hui Zhen porridge canisters are embedded with the story behind Tsuji's bamboo banks. With words of encouragement, volunteers use their love to warm the hearts of local residents. <laughs> Walking outside, Tsuji volunteers happily chat with the local residents. Ms. Takiguchi, who is a local resident, welcomes the volunteers to her home. <laughs> There she prepares a table of food and hot tea to welcome the volunteers. The volunteers take the chance to explain to her Tsuji's three good thoughts when drinking tea. Tsuji's three good thoughts when drinking tea. First sip is to say good words. Second sip is to think good thoughts. After the disaster, it inspired the compassionate hearts within everyone. Now we all help each other out. It is something we gained after the disaster. The disaster killed many, and those that survived are severely traumatized. We have professional doctors that take care of their problems and help them overcome the pain. The disaster victims don't know when they can move back to their homes. However, city volunteers promise to continue their love and care for the local residents, and they hope to spread the seeds of love further into Japan. In our continuing reports on the BRT systems, we return to Taiwan, where the cities of Taizong and Kaohsiung are currently in the process of finalizing plans for the building of BRT lines. Although public ridership is around 37% in Taipei and New Taipei City, it stands at 7.6% in Taizong and 6.6% in Kaohsiung. Currently, these two cities are exploring ways to encourage more residents to ride public transportation, and the BRT is front and center in both cities' plans for the future. I usually wait around 10 to 15 minutes for the bus. I will often arrive early, but the bus is often late. A bus system with arrival times that are impossible to predict will never be popular and is one of the reasons for the popularity of the MRT in Taipei. However, an MRT cannot stand alone as policymakers in Kaohsiung have discovered. Since the Kaohsiung MRT does not service enough areas, it is simply not convenient enough, and therefore, many residents have no incentive to give up their motorcycles and cars. Thus, introducing other forms of public transportation has become vital. The Kaohsiung MRT currently has only two lines that run north and south and east and west. To this, the city government hopes to add 
two BRT lines to extend their service on the North and South Line and connect to the light rail service that is planned for the future. At present, we just have two lines, which is not enough. We're doing our best to open up several new shuttle bus lines, but the quality of these buses is hard to maintain at an acceptable standard. At this stage, we hope that the two new BRT lines can fill in the holes in our transportation network. A dense and speedy transportation network is a prerequisite to getting residents to give public transportation a try. In Taichung, which is currently building its own MRT, the BRT has become an option due to its low cost. In building the MRT, we are spending about two billion U.S. dollars for 17 kilometers of lines. That is to say, we spend about 140 million U.S. dollars for every kilometer of subway line. Yet for the BRT, every kilometer only costs about 3.5 million U.S. dollars. For the six total lines planned, about 186 kilometers, we estimate it would cost around 23 billion U.S. dollars using subway lines alone, but only 900 million U.S. dollars if those lines are BRT instead. BRT systems can be constructed quickly and won't strain the pocketbooks of local governments. But with so many residents using their own vehicles and less than 10% of residents taking the bus, does the BRT have a future? This is going to be the main transfer station for the BRT. It will bring together the BRT, public buses, bike lanes and tour buses. However dense a public network is, buses can't deliver residents to their doors. But residents have a choice of using bicycles to cover the last distance to their homes. The key is convenience and low cost. When these conditions are met, residents will be willing to give public transportation a shot. With the BRT, we hope to quickly increase public transportation ridership from 10 to 20 percent. This is an important milestone. At 20 percent, after building the MRT, we will already have a sufficient base of users of public transportation to take advantage of it. Taichung is the first city in Taiwan to charge motorcycle parking as a way to encourage residents to use more public transportation. Yet policies like this are limited in scope and support. And thus, cities like Kaohsiung and Taichung are depending on the construction of the BRT to help transform the commuting habits of their citizens and make their cities even more livable and eco-friendly. In 2002, dengue fever infected some 5,000 people and took the lives of 21 in southern Taiwan. To prevent the disease from spreading, apart from the local health bureau, the Environmental Protection Agency and even police officers have been mobilized to encourage the general public to maintain a clean environment. An inspection team from Taiwan's Census of Disease Control has been working hard over the past 10 years to minimize the spreading of dengue fever. Prior to carrying out their inspection work, everyone gathers for a pre-notice meeting. Apart from getting all the equipment and tools ready, the inspection team must also take note of personal safety. Our prevention work from dengue fever began in 2001. With help from the local police, the 10-year-long fight against dengue fever continues as these inspection staff go door to door and street to street to search for any corners that mosquitoes might hide. After their work is done, they return to their lab to carry out further research. The insects are then categorized into larvae, pupa to fully grown mosquitoes, and put into individual boxes. 
In just a glance, inspection staff Huang Zijian is able to differentiate the types and even the sex of these mosquitoes. We will get the yellow fever and tiger mosquitoes from the wild. So under the microscope, we are able to differentiate them. We have to breed the tiger mosquitoes separately. We separated about 1,000 of them in three hours. Yellow fever mosquitoes are the main carriers of the dengue fever in Kaohsiung. With decades of experience in his work, Huang is able to categorize the different mosquitoes because of his passion and interest in the research. If you have the interest and passion, you can make great breakthrough. But if it is just a daily routine or boring job, then it will be difficult to continue on. This laboratory is set up to accurately record the habitat of these mosquitoes, and inspection staff are all hard at work taking notes and examining these dengue carriers. I'm getting farsighted much earlier. <laughs> Another important member of the mosquito laboratory is the smiley Xiao Xian, who used to work in the business industry. When asked why she is able to remain passionate about her work after a decade, Xiao Xian says the answer is really simple. You can see that most of our team members are in their middle age, but we all work really hard at what we do. Why are we doing this? We don't have any goal other than working to save the health of Kaohsiung's residents. As long as people are healthy and live in a clean environment, that's our common goal and all we want to see. Standing on the front line of dengue fever's prevention, the heavy responsibility of keeping the disease away is on the shoulders of each inspection staff member. However, to each and every one of them, it is work they happily take on each day. Next, we join a group of inspection staff as they go door to door in search of lava that might turn into dangerous mosquitoes. From garages, stock rooms to abandoned toilets, all hidden corners are checked. Wearing their distinctive blue uniform, these inspection staff, who refer to themselves as Smurfs, work all year round to keep Taiwan's residents safe from the mosquito borne disease. Just by looking at the larva inside the glass bottle, inspection staff member Chen Yi Yang can tell the age of the larva. To search for the larva that might turn into carriers of dengue fever, 60-year-old Chen Yi Yang and his partner, 56-year-old Qi Hai Hua, look from one corner to another. We have to pay attention to every detail. We must check the toilet seats. If they rarely use this or haven't used it for days, we might find lava inside. Without lights, the staff can only rely on a torch and net to catch the insects and are alerts to any buckets or bottles. As long as there is a bucket, we have to check and see if there is water that has collected after the rain. If there is water, we will take it out and see if we can find any lava in there. Upon finding lava, Chen takes out his tools to make samples and also teach the residents ways to maintain a clean living environment. The bags these inspection staff carry are equipped with all the tools necessary to help them do their job. No, I didn't invent this. This was given to us. The bottle, we made it ourselves. We have to control our strength and not let go of the mosquitoes. I need to be careful so I don't suck them in. If not, my stomach will be filled with them, and then I will have become immune to dengue. It's inside now. There's many flying around. My back is heavy. This is a glass bottle to store the lava, and there's also a straw to eat. It is quite heavy, but I'm used to it. At first, when I started working, my arms and back would get tired. What's the most tiring part of this work? It's all right once you get used to it. We had to climb those stairs. It was quite tiring, but now, after a while, it feels all right. Getting used to carrying a three kilo bag on their shoulders and going door to door to seek out any mosquitoes that might be carriers of the dengue fever. Each and every of these inspection staff all have over a decade of experience in the field.
We are in a battle with mosquitoes every day. We need to bring facial masks and a towel. These are our basic tools. There's also medication, and we have to wear long pants to avoid insect bites. We also put on old clothes as a precaution because there are dogs around. If we are not careful, we might get bitten by one. Whether it is for Chen Yi Yang, a former businessman, or for Qi Hai Hua, who used to be a full time housewife, all have gained years of knowledge and experience in the fight against dengue fever. Before the residents would think what we do is useless and that it is a waste of money. Back in 2002 and 2003, members of the public didn't really take it well, but in the last two years, there's been a dramatic change. People actually say thank you these days. Despite having to deal with the danger of getting bitten by dogs and misunderstanding from the general public, these inspection staff have continued on with their work. When we are carrying out our duties, we don't really think about the fact that we might get bitten or get dengue. We just get our best because someone will need to do this work, and if we don't, then people will get infected. <laughs> Though having to work during the weekends and needing to carry out experiments on the lava when they return to the office, these inspection staff, with an average age of over 40, are determined to continue in the fight against dengue fever to prevent further spreading of the disease. Also in Taiwan, we meet Yan Weiting, who was born without a right forearm but always sees the glass as half full. Yan has not let her disability stop her from playing table tennis or attending Taoyang University of Technology in Taizong. She hopes to inspire others with disabilities to not let their condition stop them from dreaming or living life to the fullest. Using the left hand to hold a pedal, Yan Wei Ting plays competitive table tennis. She has to overcome balance issues due to the loss of one arm. If she swings too wide, it's easy for her to lose her balance. Sometimes I will accidentally make a wide swing. I tell myself to make smaller motions. Sometimes I have a hard time finding my balance when I swing from left to right. Yen tries her best to conquer her physical disability. Born without a right arm, Yen Wei Ting started playing table tennis three years ago. Interest plus practice has made her the professional player that she is today. Balance-wise, sometimes she has a hard time keeping it, so in that way, it's hard for her, but she has improved a lot in this past year. Besides achieving what seems impossible in table tennis, Yen using one hand can type up to 36 Chinese characters in one minute. Although I'm missing an arm, I feel I can still do so much more. I hope to inspire others. No mountain is too high for Yan Weiting. Her biggest wish is to represent Taiwan in future competitions, not only bringing pride to Taiwan, but to herself as well. We stay in Taiwan at the end of our program and join team a medical staff as they hold a free health check at Kaohsiung's Xiso Recycling Station for its recycling volunteers and care recipients. A grandma and grandson pair who received the medical service were deeply grateful for its city's help. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for tuning in. Bye.